right, everybody, we're going to get started back up. Uh, my name's Justin Richard, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Sarah Squire, a consultant out of the Seattle area who's doing a lot of really great work in uh, the identity space over a number of years here. And this is going to be a really fantastic talk, uh, Identity in 1000 Words. So, Sarah? So I'm Sarah. I hold a piece of paper from a school that helped me learn about computers and how to help computers do things quickly and safely so that computers can help people buy things and talk to each other. I also have a piece of paper from some important people who agree that I know a lot about people who try to lie to computers and how to make computers better and harder to lie to. I'm not going to do the whole talk like that. <laughs> Let me explain why I'm talking to you like your six-year-old. So my undergraduate degree is in physics. And there's no one more hallowed in the halls of American university physics buildings than Albert Einstein. And while he had many deep and interesting things to say about physics, one of his best observations was not about physics itself, but about learning. He said that if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. In order to call yourself an expert, you have to be able to communicate clearly and unambiguously to non-experts. I would posit that many people purporting to be experts in the field of identity can't actually explain what we do. So last year, a hero of mine, probably a hero of yours if you've ever read the webcomic XKCD, came out with a book on exactly this concept. That book was called Thing Explainer, and that person is named Randall Monroe. Thing Explainer is a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. It has detailed diagrams of most common words, uh, sorry, detailed diagrams of things like uh, rockets and refrigerators. But the catch is that the diagrams only use the 10 hundred most common words in the English language, of which thousand is not one. I can't show you anything from that book because intellectual property law is terrible. But fortunately for us, Mr. Monroe did a promotional poster for a cruise that's being hosted by a nerd musician named Jonathan Colton. So here's an example of a diagram of a cruise ship using only the thousand most common words in the English language. And in a catch, the word thousand is not actually in the thousand most common words, so that's why we call it the 10 hundred most common words. So as you can see, Jonathan or Colton are not in the 10 hundred most common words. So Jonathan Colton became face hair music guy. And cruise ship is not allowed, so that became crazy water house. The hull is now a thing that keeps the water out, so there isn't a problem. <laughs> I think this is so great. So a colleague of mine, Matt McAdam, from the University of Washington identity team, went out to see Randall Monroe with me when he came to Seattle to promote the Thing Explainer book. And we went out to beers after the talk and said, what if we did this with identity? So I worked at the University of Washington for five years before I quit to do independent consulting. They have a fantastic identity team. And one of the traditions on the team is to have people do a lightning round every so often of different identity terms. So they have a deck of flashcards with things like authentication and authorization. And they try to see how well they can define those terms on the fly. It helps when they're in a meeting and they have to quickly explain what it is that they do and why it's important. And it helps a lot when, the, when they're in the middle of incident response and there are like five executives on one conference bridge who want to know what the hell is broken and how we're going to fix it. So Matt and I took those lightning round terms and started trying to define them using only the 10 hundred most common words in the English language. And we found out that it's actually an extremely valuable exercise. So before I came here, I actually workshopped this talk at an unconference in Silicon Valley called the Internet Identity Workshop, which we shortened to IIW. I highly recommend attending this conference for those of you who haven't been. It's super fun and highly interactive. And you get to hear what people are working on right now as opposed to what they were working on back when the call for speaker submissions was open. So I did this at IIW, and it was a really valuable exercise for those folks, too. I want to specifically call out um, Nat from OIDF, Annabelle from Amazon, Alan from HP and George from Google, they all contributed significantly to some of the examples I'm going to show you. So to give us some context as we work through this, let's go over a normal identity elevator pitch. So you find yourself in the elevator with the CEO, and you say, you know, Stephanie from Forrester was telling me last Tuesday night 
just telling all of us, that we should be spending at least 8% of our IT budget on identity. And your CEO says, tell me why. And you start spewing jargon, right? Well, we're not using consistent identifiers from a single system of records. So the assertions that come through during, it, during the authentication events with our single sign-on system can't be correlated correctly. Not to mention that our attribute release policies don't follow principles of least privilege or protect privacy. And don't get me started on how our identity proofing procedures don't include attributes required for our authorization protocols. Ding! The CEO leaves the elevator firm in the knowledge that your Greek language skills are exemplary. So let's break down some of the terms I just used into the 10 hundred most common English words. Let's start right off with identity. We are at an identity conference. We all do identity. So what is identity? It's tempting, but not very descriptive, to say, well, it's who people are. But do only people have identities? What about things? OK, so how about what things are? Well, that's not really very descriptive either. Like, what field do you work in? Oh, I work on the what things are field. <laughs> no. So we need to get deeper into the weeds here. Ultimately, identity is about description, right? It's a noun, not an adjective, but at its core, identity is about describing. And I have to say, I'm really proud of this definition. A set of facts about a thing that make it what it is. People count as things, right? Yes. Identity, what I am, the facts about me that make me who I am. That's what we do. That is our stock and trade, ultimately. The value we provide as identity professionals comes from the value of wrangling all the facts about all the things that make them what they are. That's nice. I love it. Let's keep going. Trust. We are really jumping into the deep end of the pool now. Andre gave an entire keynote about trust. What do we mean when we say that? And what are we allowed to say in the 10 hundred words? We're allowed to talk about promises. We're allowed to talk about truth and lies. Is trust a feeling? Is trust a metric? That's an interesting concept. Level of assurance is a trust metric, right? What if we take that tack? What, it, what is it in the levels of assurance that lets us know how much trust we should have? Well, there are reasons, right? Multi-factor authentication is a reason to believe that someone isn't lying about who they are. So what if we say that it's a reason to think that a person or a computer is telling the truth? I think that's super close, but trust isn't just about you're the right person or thing and you're giving me correct information, right? Trust is about how you will behave in the future. So we've built federations like in common precisely so that we can better guess how other members of the federation will behave in the future. We want them to keep their promises about security and privacy and interoperability. So what if we said that trust is a reason to think that a person or a computer will keep promises and tell the truth? That goes way beyond technology. That's what we want from our friends and our colleagues, not just our IDPs and RPs. So you're going to like this definition. Are you ready? Trust is one of the 10,000 most common words. <laughs> no definition required. Nailed it. Moving on. Authorization. What your users can and cannot do. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This one is about permissions, right? We could use a metaphor, something about hats with keys attached to them, something about round pegs and square holes. But those are all specific access control schemes, ABAC or RBAC or claims. We need something broader. Authorization is just about what you're allowed to do, allowing a person or a thing to do something. When we talk about authorization servers, we're talking about the engine that decides whether something is allowed, right? Allowing a person or a thing to do something. It sounds so simple when you put it that way. Let's move on to identity proofing. Are you John Black, the upstanding Pan Am pilot whose checks never bounce? Do you have an ID card? We covered identity, a set of facts about a thing that make it what it is, so now we just need to prove that. We need to make sure that the real world, the meat space world, has the same facts about you that our digital system does. Making sure that a person is who they say they are, that their online facts match their real life facts. Oops. Sorry, that didn't come up. 
This doesn't say how we make sure. It doesn't prescribe ID cards or facial recognition. It doesn't say how sure we have to be. It's just a general process of making sure. Moving on to authentication. I think I've said the word authentication 200 times this week. I've probably heard it 2,000 times. It is core to our business. And one of the reasons that it's core to our business is that a lot of people get it wrong. NIST got it wrong on Special Publication 863, the Federal Authentication Guidelines. The original draft of 863 outlined levels of assurance that conflated authentication and identity proofing. So there was no level of assurance that could describe a very well author authenticated pseudonymous user, like a whistleblower, like a political dissident, like the Iranian protesters who filled Twitter in 2009 with images of police brutality that the local media and government did not want reported. Identity proofing those people could endanger their lives. Not properly authenticating those people might lead to their accounts being deleted or compromised. NIST is one of my clients. I'm a co-author on the rewrite of 863. And because we thought about these issues, because we broke down what authentication really is and is not, levels of assurance are gone. Now we have authenticator assurance level and identity assurance level. And we can communicate those separately over the wire. So authentication isn't about identity. It's about being sure that the user at the end of the wire is the same one we saw last time which is different from them being who they say they are. OK. This one should be way easier. A password is just a secret, right? We can't say secret, but we can get close. We can say it's something known only to the person who's supposed to know it. And there's a mistake on this slide. I didn't actually catch it until after I had turned the slides in, but I didn't resend them because this actually proves my point that it's really, really difficult for our brains to separate identity from authentication. Does a password give an indication that someone is who they say they are? No, actually. We just went over this. This slide should read, something known only to the person who's supposed to know it that can be used to show that they are the same person we saw last time. So how about attributes? Metadata, single, white, female, over 21, Seattle, Sarah at EngageIdentity.com. This one's really easy. Those are facts. Facts about a person or thing. Attributes, simple. Assertion, more complicated. So close to an attribute, but subtly different. If I say that I assert something, there's an implicit statement there that it might not be true. If it were true, I would be stating it, not asserting it. Assertions are generally carried in tokens transmitted across the wire. There's a difference between attributes and assertions that involves communication between parties. Someone is saying something to someone else, and there's a trust relationship between them. Fact about a person said by someone you trust. So we took the definition for attribute, and we added a verb, a communication verb. Someone is saying something to someone else, and we added the concept of a trust relationship. It doesn't have to be a strong trust relationship. It doesn't say how much you trust them. But even if you've never seen them before, even if they just dynamically registered from a sketchy IP address, they're still in the system. There's still some level of trust, even if it's near zero. So let's talk about single sign-on. This one's a classic. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, we need single sign-on, and I say, that's wonderful. Security and usability wins. Great idea. How do you want to implement that? And you get the blank stare. As Identorati, we're deep in the weeds. You actually don't hear the phrase single sign-on a lot here. You hear OAuth, OpenID Connect, SAML, UMA. When we think single sign-on, we think about specific technologies that can skin that cat in different ways. When normal people talk about single sign-on, though, they are technology agnostic. They just want a cat with no skin. So how do we define what it is that we're trying to achieve? Well, it's complicated. It has to do with authorization and access management and credentialing. But ultimately, they want to use one key, sign into one place, and be able to access everything they're allowed to do. Letting a person or a thing sign into one place and get into other places they're allowed to go to. Good. I like it. What about roles? When we talk about people's identities, the set of facts that make them who they are, this is a somewhat transient one. 
we want to capture the fact that it's an active. It's something you're doing right now. The good news is that jobs is one of the 10 hundred words. And jobs and roles are super close in meaning. So we can just say a set of jobs that a person or a thing does. Great. Identifier. Don't ask Kalia about this one. Her head will explode, and that would be messy. I actually had an identifier mentor in my career. How awesome is that? Uh, Brian Arkels, who many of you know wrote the book on LDAP, uh, was assigned to tutor me in identifiers. Uh, he gave me homework to go out and find identifiers and come back and discuss whether they were really identifiers. Were they unique? And the answer I found was that it depends on context. So in this room, Sarah is probably a unique identifier for me. In this hotel, it's probably not. So it's, assen it's essential in this definition that we include a context, a domain. But we can't say context. And you guessed it, we can't say domain either. The name of a thing, but only when that thing is the only thing with that name in that situation. I'm not super happy with the word name in this definition. I think label might have been more accurate. But we can't say that, so name is good enough. Credentialing. This shouldn't be too hard. We already have a definition for password. We just need to add in some other shenanigans to account for different kinds of authenticators, something you know, something you have, something you are. Or, as is more often the case with me, something you'll forget, something you'll lose, and something you'll get a paper cut on. Giving someone a thing that lets them show that they are who they say they are. I did it on this slide, too. <laughs> does the credential say anything about identity? No. It does not. It lets them show that they're the same person we saw last time. Just pretend that it says that. <laughs> Only they can use it, and it shows that they are or have or know a thing that other people don't. That's so elegant. System of record. Go ahead, try to explain cache consistency to a three-year-old. I will wait. This one's tricky. We went through a lot of drafts on this one. It took a long time to get right, but I really like this definition. There we go. A place you can trust that holds the real things you want to know, not old, out-of-date things. If two things don't agree about facts, this one wins. That's so great. Systems of record and cache consistency existed long before computers. <coughs> they aren't actually technical topics at all. A six-year-old can understand the concept of information that's out of date. He thinks there are cookies in the cookie jar, but he's unaware that his sister ate all the cookies. His mental cache is out of date. The cookie jar system of record wins by indicating to him that there are, in fact, no more cookies. Assurance. So we talked about trust. Assurance is very similar to trust. If we talk about levels of assurance, or now identity assurance levels, or authenticator assurance levels, what do we mean by assurance? It's a level of certainty, right? Well, we can't say certainty, but we can get close. How much I believe something that was said to be a fact. So I'm going to believe the facts in a signed and encrypted token sent through a back channel hell of a lot more than I'm going to believe the facts that a bearer token that came through the browser. It has a higher level of assurance. So I left the hardest one for last. I've been talking to a lot of people about this one. I talked to people working in social media, talked to people working on consent receipts, encryption, privacy law, people in government, people in academia, in private industry. What do we mean when we say privacy? Is it a right? Is it a responsibility? I went through lots of drafts on this one. I think it's an ability. Whether anyone has the right to this ability or the degree to which external entities are responsible for protecting this ability is a policy question. I think for the definition, though, privacy is being able to say who can know what about me. Having a privacy-preserving or privacy-enhancing system doesn't mean that people can't share. It doesn't mean that people can't share absolutely everything with the whole world. It does mean that they get to decide. They get a say. I like this definition a lot. So I want to close with a new and improved elevator speech now that we've thought through the core concepts of our industry. 
So remember we were in the elevator, Stephanie from Forrester says we should spend 8% of our IT budget on identity, tell me why. Well, we don't have a good way to make sure that the things we know about people aren't out of date. So when they sign in and a trusted computer tells us facts about them, we can't be sure those facts are true. Also, the people we work with don't have a say in who knows what about them because our computers give away more facts about those people than they need to. People would probably buy more things if they had a say in who knows what about them. And when people do tell us real life facts about themselves, we don't ask for the facts we need in order to decide whether to allow them to do things. And we don't want them doing things they're not allowed to do. Ding, what's your CEO gonna say? My guess is she'll say something like, I don't know why you're talking to me like I'm five. <laughs> but she'll probably also say that she understands the problems you're trying to solve. And I'm not saying that everything has to have this strict of a standard, but I would like you to go back to your companies, your working groups, your standards organizations, and do this exercise. Think about how you communicate and whether it's helping you. Think about whether you actually understand the work that you do and its larger context. Because identity work is important and impactful, and the language we use to describe it should be thoughtful and elegant. That's all I've got. Thanks, everybody. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. I went really fast. If anyone has questions or comments. All right, any questions or comments? We can run a mic out to the audience. Do you want to, well. yeah, can we run a mic up here? Yeah, uh, hold on. Thank you. All right, I think, yay, you live mic. All right. <laughs> Thank you, that? Justin. Um, Two things. First, uh, how long did it take you to come up with all the definitions for this thing? What kind of time period was that? I know you started at IIW. Uh, I started before I had, I started like one thing, like this has been going on for a year. <laughs> and uh, Just at, you know, talking to various people about like, if you were to say this, how would you say it? What do, what do you think? So, and was online was really one of the thousand most common words? Uh, did I say online? All these went through the, there's a, uh, so the most popular version of this is a version of the Saturn V rocket that he calls Upgoer 5. So there's an Upgoer 5 text editor online. Oh, cool. Okay. And I ran it through that. So if, if it was in there, then it must be. I think hyphenated words sometimes get a pass when the constituent parts are oh, in the list. That could be. So online may have slipped. Yeah. Possible. All right. Any other questions? No? Oh, wait, yes. So obviously I think this is an interesting exercise, not only to help you understand the technology, but to explain it to others. But you've got to bring it up to a certain level. And depending on who the audience is, determines how high of a level that goes. Right. How much do you, how high do you go? I mean, you kind of want to stay as, you want to take the lowest common denominator, right? So yeah. what's, what's the best rule of thumb to use when you're creating different versions of the definitions, the documents, the? That's always a really difficult question because knowing your audience is a really difficult problem. And often the audience that you intend it for isn't the audience where it ends up. So how many people have sent in a draft of something really early and had it end up on a desk that it wasn't supposed to get to? And you're like, no, it wasn't done. Um, so knowing your audience is really tough. And I think you just have to uh, have a feeling about how technical are they? How much do they understand the field? And the ability to get down to this, like literally to explain it to a child. <laughs> you know, that's the best you can do. Explain it to someone who's not in your industry and doesn't have a technical background. So it's, it's more of a um, suggestion than question. Um, I think su successful politicians probably aim at 10-year-olds rather than five-year-olds. So maybe you allow yourself a slightly larger vocabulary and, and iterate it again. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> we'll grow up together, we'll get like 10th grade level, 12th grade level, it'll be fun. <laughs> Any 
Any other questions? No? Nope? Okay. Thanks, you guys. All right. All right, thank you all very much. Another 10 minute break or so um, until the next presentation. And uh, so we'll see you here. <laughs>